do spinal angiogram and try to embolize uh, this very vascular tumor. Uh, he managed, but this is a very extensive tumor. So this is the tumor that we removed, and this is the patch of the dura to give space for the lesion. And this is the patient. And this is the histology. And this is the immunostaining of that case. Uh, this was reported by Dr. Samuel Farsakh. So how can you diagnose von hippel lindau disease? You have to have two CNS hemangiolastomas. One is not enough. One is called sporadic. Two means that you have von hippel lindau or you have two retinal hemangioblastomas. So either two retinal or two CNS, or one hemangioblastoma of retina or CNS plus a vascular tumor. In this case, you would call it a syndrome. So this is how you diagnose von hippel lindau disease. And this is one of my cases with this extensive hemangioblastomas everywhere. What is the natural history of hemangioblastoma? Do they grow? Yes, they do. And this is a paper published 2003 on the natural history of hemangioblastomas. 70% will grow during the median period of 32 months. So you rest assured they will increase. That was a large series in multicentric uh, study of 160 consecutive cases. They will grow. Another case, again, by a group of researchers, 2010, and they showed this. You can see the tumor, and this is how it evolved, or this tumor and how it evolves. So they grow. They are bad tumors. And the, the growth is not in a predicted manner. It does not grow as a sort of a periodic type of thing. Sometimes they grow for a while, and then they would stop growing for a while. So you are in my cases. Back in 1993, this lady came to me with this kind of tumors. She was discovered actually accidentally. So we waited on her. You don't go and pick this one or this one and this one and this one. You go if the patient is symptomatic. This was discovered accidentally. And this is how it evolved, 2008. This was a little rather slow. Some patients, it can be very rough. So what should you do once you discover a patient? How do you screen? So this is a screening protocol. You take family history. Why? It is autosomal dominant kind of inheritance. 80% of von hippel now patients, they have an affected parent. So you have to get the parents. And the offsprings of these patients, they have 50% risk of inheriting von Hippel. So you have to get the whole family or screen. And you have to do full ophthalmological examination. We have seen the lesions. Two of my patients, and they come with artificial eye. Already they have retinal, uh, retinoplastum, retinal hemangioblastoma, and they had excision of the eye was 10% in, in, in the creation. You have to do the brain MRI, the whole spine MRI with contrast, abdominal and pelvis CT scan and chest CT scan as part of a screening protocol. So it's a dilemma, financial medical dilemma. And you have to collect 24 hour serum for catecholamines, vanillyl mandelic acid, which is a byproduct of amphetamines and uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. So you have to check that. So what are the options of dealing with these cases? Do you take biopsy? Never. These cases are very vascular. You end with a catastrophe. Would you use gamma knife? The word is misnomer. It has nothing to do with knife. It has nothing to do with surgery. I call it stereotactic radiotherapy. Do we have to do preoperative embolization? Or should we go for surgery? The answer is, Surgery is the first choice, it's the, the, the best choice, and you go for complete accession, you go around and you stop the bleeders, as you have seen in the film. These are, these are the pictures that you see. 
it's a frightening dilated veins vascular you touch they bleed so you have to go around it and deal with it like an AVM pictures of different surgeries done for these cases what about the cyst this is simple hemangioblastoma sporadic nodule and the cyst you just take the nodule you don't need to do anything with the cyst if you remove, if you keep the nodule cyst will come back again some recent reports show that the wall may contain tumors so should we take the wall like in this case in this case no i don't but if you have a case like this which was reported back in 2008 there is contrast enhancement of the wall then you must remove the wall Should we do preoperative embolization? Let's see what the literature says. This is one of the researchers in American Journal of Neuroradiology. He had five cerebellar cases, which he did the embolization. He had just one case of a tumor swelling. So this was considered a good outcome. Another researcher in the uh, division of the neuroradiology to 2000, he had two hemangioblastomas, which he embolized. The two had hemorrhages, very bad, poor outcome. So it's not good. Bernard George, who is a friend of mine, French vascular surgeon in Paris, published this in Journal of Neurosurgery, 2007. He had three cerebellar hemangioblastomas. The three had hemorrhage, the three died. So he considered that this is a bad procedure to do for cerebellar hemangioblastoma. While he, while he had the four cases of spine hemangioblastomas and he had no hemorrhage in that. Of course, our uh, interventional radiologists in the audience would maybe uh, comment on that. Another researcher, one spine hemangioma, one massive bleeding, 100%, the bad. So you don't do it unless it is really necessary. What about radio surgery? I said, I put the gamma knife, I don't use the terminology, it's called stereotactic radiotherapy. Radio surgery is a misnomer. Gamma knife is a misnomer. And I am a gamma knife user since 1995, uh, 15, yeah, what, 20 years ago. I don't like the word radio surgery because there is no surgery in it. I don't like the word knife. It is called the stereotactic radiotherapy. Let's see, is it good or bad? Dade Lansford was one of the pioneers of gamma knife in the United States. He published this paper in 2018. He had 74 tumors. He gave them uh, radiotherapy and there was no change. So, he published this paper in 2018. No, not echoes in the It's considered as not good. Another researcher in 2011, he had 14 patients, and there was no change in 70% in the population of the quantity. Another researcher had three hemangioblastomas, 30 had no change in size, so it is bad. Again, Ted Lansford uh, from the States published this paper in a multicentric study in 2013. And he says, well, the overall survival is good. But again, there was no change in size. So some people consider that as good. I consider it as bad. What about chemotherapy? There is no chemotherapy for hemangioblastomas. So we just mentioned all this as a presentation, as a prelude to our presentation. So we'll go back to our patient, the Iraqi patient, the 34-year-old Iraqi patient. As I said, he was diagnosed as von Hippel Lindau with retinal lesions, renal lesions, and pancreatic lesions. While in Tunisia, he was diagnosed to have a right retinal hemangioblastoma. He had a bilateral partial nephrectomy, both kidneys, partially resected. 40 to 50% of the kidneys were removed. It was renal cell carcinoma. And he had excision of the pancreatic cyst. And this is the pathological report from Tunisia. And following the surgery, he had radiotherapy. All this in Tunisia, two years before coming to us. And this is the genetic lab in Tunisia. And they have done the genetic workup. 
and they found that a heterozygous mutation was detected in this VHR gene in this patient. This is their report. And they have brought the mother and the father, the family, and they found that the familial variant was not detected in the parents. So from Tunisia, he went back to Iraq because his father was relocated to Iraq. Six weeks before he came to us, prior to admission to Jordan, he collapsed suddenly with loss of consciousness. He was intubated, ventilated. They have done MRI and he was found to have hydrocephalus. They have put a VP shunt and he stayed in the ICU for a long period of time. So they have done tracheostomy for him. And just three weeks before he came to us, he again complained of headache nausea, vomiting, blood region, all criteria of increased intracranial pressure, and he was attacked with the weakness of his lower limbs. When he came to us, his vital signs were normal, blood gases were normal, CBC, bleeding profile, kidney function, electrolytes, liver function tests were normal, chest X-ray and ECG were within normal. An examination, he was bedridden, the glass performance scale was 10, 10 T, means that he had hypertension T. And he had bilateral horizontal nystagmus. He had no parameter signs. And he showed the midline abdominal scar of the abdominal surgery, which he had. This is him with his tracheostomy tube, bedridden. This is his eye movements. And this is the MRI, which he had six weeks before coming to Jordan. Again, you can see the lesion in different sequences. And you can see, as we said, they love the superior surface of the cerebellum. They love to be near the sinuses. And they have done a shunt. Of course, to me, this is not good. Just because he had hydrocephalus, people would do a shunt. This is not good. The best shunt is no shunt. We train our residents to put a shunt. This is bad. Because if you remove the causative lesion of the hydrocephalus, there is no need for a shunt. Shunt is the weapon of the inefficient surgery. As simple as that. People would come with excuses like, oh, it was midnight and he was going off. So what? Put an external drain, if you like, and then remove the tumor. But don't put a shunt unnecessarily, just simply because you can remove the causative lesion causing hydrocephalus. You don't put a shunt. The best shunt is no shunt. And if you look at the logbook of our neurosurgical residents, not our, that are all around the world, the logbook contains about 70% if you look at the experience is a shunt. And the vision of the shunt. The vision of the upper end of the shunt. The vision of the lower end of the shunt. The vision of the lower end of the shunt. The vision of the lower end of the shunt. So this is the rest of the MRI in Baghdad. And this is our MRI in Horizon. You can see that the region has increased. You see that case. So the music grew here, it grew within a few weeks. And even the region of the spine, the cervical lesion has increased. And the thoracic cord, they have increased. And in the lumbar area. And again, I, I point out of the writing the name of the patient on MRI. This is bad habit. Uh, this means that the technicians are out of control. The radiologists don't control them because they should not write on the MRI. Because I choose this out of the big series of lumbar MRI, which shows the lesion. Otherwise, the writing was actually on top of the lesion. So you may miss the lesion because the technician wrote the name on the MRI. So we did round of consultations. Dr. Hamarne is here. No, Dr. Hamarne is the ENT. Uh, this case was done in uh, um, with Dr. Hamarne. He was following. I'm here. Are you here? Do you want to comment? Or should I go? Please come. Come. Remember, this patient had a tracheostomy tube, 
So we ask the command to say, should we keep the tracker to meet tube? Should we change it? What should we do? Please. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Yes, so the initial assessment uh, for a tracheostomy tube for this patient would be to assess the vocal cord movement. Um, so we did a fiber optic uh, laryngoscopy in the office for him, uh, and that showed normal vocal cord movement. And that gives you uh, a decent idea that decannulation for this patient will be easy. Um, however, he was going through a major procedure. So the decision was made to keep the tracheostomy in situ, finish the procedure, give him some time after the procedure, and then try to decannulate him. Uh, which actually happened smoothly afterwards. The other issue with the tracheostomy is that we usually get tracheostomies from abroad with a single tube, uh, with a single lumen tracheostomy, and they are, they are a pain to uh, maintain and clean and, and do suction for them. And if, if they get blocked in the middle of the night, you need to remove the whole tube and replace it again. Uh, so what, what I usually do is I replace these tubes with a a double cannulated tube. So if the inner tube uh, blocks, you can remove the inner tube, clean it and put it back. And that usually saves the patient's uh, uh, unnecessary interventions uh, for the future. So Salman, in retrospect, do you believe that was actually needed, the tracheostomy that we had? Uh, well, he was in ICU for a long time. He was intubated for, for a long time. The Actually, the guidelines for um, performing tracheostomy for patients uh, in ICU um, has dropped considerably. It used to be two weeks, it went down to 10 days. Now the recommendations, if you if your patient is considered to have a seven day intubation in ICU, you'd better uh, track, put the trachea in as early as possible. Um, and um, in some centers now, three days in ICU is a tracheostomy patient. And they usually do it very quickly if they have a thin neck. Uh, so the, the threshold for putting a tracheostomy in for a patient in ICU has, has dropped considerably. Um, I think because the complications from a tracheostomy has dropped considerably. Uh, so patients look after and they, uh, the nursing staff look after tracheostomies better now. We asked uh, Dr. Riyad Saeed and uh, Fuad Saeed as nephrologists to see the patient. Uh, and uh, because we know that he had renal cell carcinoma, he had partial nephrectomy, so on to be sure. Again, this is a holistic approach to the patient. You don't look at his brain and his spinal cord. This is a total patient with multi-system that you need to assess. So we need to know what's the condition of his renal system after the partial nephrectomies he had. So the baseline creatinine was 1.3. He had, of course, the MRI with contrast, and he was following that he was hydrated to prevent any uh, contrast-induced nephropathy. We asked the cardiologist, Dr. Ahmad Haddad, to see him. Uh, and he performed an echo, normal heart size, liver function is good, ejection traction 60%, and he had mild prolapse of lung. Again, holistic approach for a patient. So, Dasi, do you want to comment? Thank you, Oscar. Now, von Hippelindau is an oncologist's nightmare um, for a lot of reasons, as you have seen beautifully laid out, these patients are prone not only for brain tumors and hemangioblastomas, they're, uh, they're prone to retin hemangioblastomas, uh, ear tumors, pancreatic tumors, cyst uh, cystadenomas, etc., pheochromocytomas, and renal cell carcinomas. And they are prone to recurrence of these tumors, and the risk is lifetime, and it does not increase with time. It actually cumulative and increases with time. That particular gentleman actually had uh, a, a decent uh, follow-up in Tunisia just before coming in. So actually he had his abdomen, uh, chest uh, screened with an MRI um, uh, within the previous few, uh, few months. And the, the trend for screening these patients have changed with time. Uh, with an attempt of relying more on enhanced MRIs to look at the chest and abdomen, just because it's important to reduce the amount of contrast you're going to use because these patients are prone to getting recurrent nephrectomies, uh, partial nephrectomies. So he had already received a, um, a partial nephrectomy uh, bilaterally. And this does not mean that he's not going to get a tumor in the remnant uh, uh, kidneys bilaterally with time. 
And that's really the nightmare of those. And because of that, you really try to minimize the CT uh, uh, contrast of CT as much as possible. So the guidelines to follow up from hyperlindals are relying more and more on enhanced MRIs for the brain, the spine, the, uh, the abdomen and the chest and skilled ultrasonography, uh, uh, looking at the uh, uh, kidneys uh, particularly. And it's really important in this case, when you have a brain lesion and a patient who actually had a diagnosis of renal cell carcinoma, you just want to um, uh, exclude the remote possibility of this being metastatic renal cell. And this was radiologically less likely, but this is something that is always in the back of your mind. So in the workup that we had, we actually, because he had a recent MRI, we elected to do an enhanced PET CT without a, 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 a CT contrast in the CT part. And that was negative. And the ultrasound, yeah. Um, and the abdomen uh, was unremarkable apart from the bilateral nephrectomies that he already had. And he had no other lesions in the pancreas. His metanephrons, and you can do serum or urine metanephrons. And those were done also recently uh, within the previous uh, uh, three months. But the, you have to be cognizant of the fact that you have to repeat the, the metanephrine serum or um, um, uh, 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 urine every six to 12 months and MRIs of the brain, spine uh, and abdomen every six to 12 months. And you want to shy away from enhanced CT as much as possible. Now, 10 to 20% of von Hippelendau, as, as was detailed by Dr. Sbeh, um, are sporadic. Uh, this patient had no family history, but the fact that this is actually a, 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 um, a germline mutation um, uh, or a somatic mutation is really important. Now, the fact that he's actually carrying this, this would mean that 50% of his progeny, should he decide to marry, would be carrier of the genes. Um, the fact that this was, the von Hippelendau gene was detected in, her, uh, in the patient, not his parents, meaning that this was a sporadic mutation. The thing that Dr. Ala asked is the PET scan, and with us here is Dr. Abdul Latif Sharif from Afia Center to tell us about the PET scan. So, okay. So, uh, good morning, everybody. So, this is a presentation. This is a very uh, short presentation of what PET scan is. As uh, you can see, the PET scan can understand, help us a little bit to understand the biology or the bio, bio uh, the molecular biology of the tumor. In a PET scan, we inject a radiopharmaceutical, and in this case, we uh, this is the radiopharmaceutical that we are injecting. It goes inside the tumor cell or inside the cell. It emits a positron, which looks like, just like an electron. It will find a nearby electron. It will just bombard that electron, and both of them will disappear. And the material will be converted into energy. This energy is X-ray. It's a form of gamma ray with a 500 electron kilovolt. And this, just like this, this will be detected by the PET machine. So what happens in a PET machine that we are detecting the signal coming from the radio pharmaceutical inside the legion in what is known as coincidence. So this is the PET ring and it's detecting what's happening inside the machine. What, what is different from other nuclear medicine facilities or machines is that it can detect, it has two photos or two X-rays, let's say, for each event that's happening inside the patient. So it helps us more to quantify and localize the tumor. And usually what happens in a conventional PET, what we know as a PET CT, usually when we are requested to do a PET CT, it's an FDG PET CT. FDG is an analog of glucose. You know that tumors take more glucose than non-tumor cells, particularly the more aggressive the tumor, the more it will take the glucose. Usually glucose gets inside the cell, it goes into glycolysis and will continue the glycolytic pathway. And FDG will be taken inside the tumor cell, but it will not continue the process of metabolism. It will get, just get stuck. It will be converted into chlorodeoxyglucose 6-phosphate and will continue to accumulate inside the cell. That's why we create usually in PET machines the contrast between a, a tumor cell and non-tumor cells, okay? Now, what's the, the problem usually is that with the brain that it consumes glucose. So PET is not, very sensitive to detect brain tumors. Now, 
this is the normal distribution of PET, of FDG in a PET machine, uh, in a PET scan. This is the brain, the heart, a little bit of the liver, a little bit of activity in the kidneys and in the uh, urinary blood. Otherwise, we don't see anything in a PET machine. But, uh, well, sometimes we have other traces in nuclear medicine other than glucose. We have a dotatoc, for example, which images the somatostatin receptors. Some tumors are known to express somatostatin receptors and not to take glucose. So I'm not going into details of that. Please, next slide. Do we have it? Yes, we have it in Jordan. Uh, this is the normal distribution of a pet, uh, of a pet dotatoc, where you can see the pituitary, the liver, the spleen, which is actually the hottest region, and then the pancreas, and that's it. Anything else is a tumor. Now, this is what happens usually in a hemangioblastoma. A hemangioblastoma does not take FDG, but takes the dotatoc. So in this case, we were asked to see, is the tumor that we are seeing in the brain, in the, in the in the cerebellum of this patient, is it FDG avid or not? If it is FDG avid, then it can come from a renal cell carcinoma. If it is not FDG avid, then it is most likely a hemangioblastoma because hemangioblastoma is the least FDG avid tumor of the cerebellum. Okay, this is a daughter talk in a patient with von Hippelin Dow syndrome, and you can see a neuroendocrine tumor in the pancreas. If this patient had a pupromocytoma that unfortunately did not express the dot So when you when you ask for PET, please, what kind of, try to determine always what kind of radiopharmaceutical you want us to use. Because this will change how we read the PET and how we do the PET. The PET is not about the image, it's, it's about the radiopharmacist, the, the radiopharmaceutical that we are injecting it. Okay. Now this is our patient. This is the large hypodense, this is the large hypodense area seen on CT, and he, he, here it is on, uh, on PET. Nothing, void. If it was a clear, uh, renal cell carcinoma, it will be hot on PET. Not seeing anything on a PET, and this is the PET CT, means that it is a tumor with low metabolic activity and it's not coming from the kidney. Thank you. So it's a hypometabolic. The major question to answer is there any remnant? <laughs> Uh, the major question to answer was, was there any remnant of the RCC component that we had? Because metastatic RCC would have had a do totally different approach to the management, yeah. as opposed to the high pretest probability of the spleen to yeah. It was the question, is it uh, somatostatin receptor positive that is to increase the possibility of the mangioblastoma would have done a dot scan? Was well, the question, do you look for something else on a PET scan? Yeah, 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 or on, for example, neuroendocrine tumor, would you have done a dot scan? And the, the question here was, is there any remnant of RCC? And it's what you could be uh, As, as I uh, alluded to in the beginning of the lecture, that this is a lecture that is recorded and transmitted to the United States to be broadcast on the TV neurosurgery by Dr. John Bennett. So if there are any questions or discussions mm -hmm. in English. And here I want to raise a question. Somebody asked, do we have PET scan in Jordan? How many PET scan machines do we have in Jordan? Currently, there are nine. Okay, nine. There are nine machines that are available in Jordan. We produce FDD uh, at the Queen's uh, Cancer at the Medina Center and at the Arsenal Center. Queen's uh, Cancer Center produces also to everybody, and they have just started producing uh, PSMA for patients. Dr. Muhammad Ahiyari, is he around? Yes. Ahmed, do we have any, anything similar to PET scan that we can use in similar cases? No. Uh, so far, I've got a cyclotron besides a PET scan or near to a PET scan. That's why you have. So, this is two cyclotrons, nine PET machines, and a population of surplus. Surplus. That's a uh, horrendous of pet machines. It's not a pet machines. Well, if you compare us to the region, yes, it's a, it's a big number. If you compare us to what is required by us or what is uh, proposed by the International Atomic Energy Agency, there are half the number required. You have to remember that there is no awareness about pet CT. We are not only uh, serving Jordan, we are serving the Middle East and the whole region. 
and number two, that the, the, the radio pharmaceutical um, uh, catalog that we are having is expanding. Well, let's consider in the future that there will be a DOPA for uh, neuroendocrine tumors and for epidemiomas, for uh, Parkinson's disease and for Parkinsonism. There will be uh, soon uh, for, uh, radioactive pharmaceuticals for uh, amyloid disease and for, for, um, for dementia and for Alzheimer's. Uh, consider that it can be used for cardiac sarcoidosis and for sarcoidosis. Consider that it can be used for infections, for people of unknown origins. Consider that its clinical implications are rapidly and rapidly and rapidly impacted. Well, yes, we need it. What, what, we need, what we need more currently in Jordan is radio pharmacy. There is no one single academically trained and academically uh, taught person in radio pharmacy in Jordan. And what we are doing is now only practice. So we have three people who can label Dotatop or FDG or TSMA and order. Only three persons. Thank only you. three persons in the whole country. Uh, question. Now the uh, speak, uh, 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 which is more advanced than, uh, no, no, no. it has more advantages uh, for tumors than the uh, usual uh, CT. No, no, no. It, 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 it's, it's a, it's a, it's a completely different. different thing. PET is something completely different than PET. Than spec, PET. Spec, spec. No, no. There is no SPET. There is PET. There is PET CT. There is MR PET. There is MR CT. Uh, there is MR PET. But there is no SPEC PET. There is one single machine that's known as the uh, Anistan machine. It can do PET, it can do PET, and it can do CT. But you can't do, in theory, by physics, by general physics, you can do a PET and a SPEC. Together. You can't do both of them together. Why? Because a SPET emits photons of an energy of 140 kilo electrons. That means dianetics are that very low energy. If you do simultaneously a PET, the PET signal will dominate, or the gamma rays from the uh, SPEC will contaminate the image to say in the universe and the world. So you can't do both at the same time. You can't do both at the same time because you do not have crystals of PET that can differentiate the energy levels between, no, between the low energy of the set and high energy of the set, unless you insert multiple rings, but this would create a very low energy. And this kind of machine still does not exist. Actually, thank you very much. In theory, has also less resolution than that. For the benefit of time, because as I said, we are addressing an international it's audience. Can we have the discussion at the end so that we are limited with the time with the United States? Can yeah. we proceed and then if we have time, we'll discuss further. Um, as I said, we are addressing an international audience and we have to say that Jordan is a medical surgical hub in the Middle East. And just to mention that we uh, in Jordan had the first open heart surgery back in 1972, renal transplant at that time, first heart, heart transplant in 1985, just IVF baby 1986 and so on. Uh, the other consultations were for the anesthetist, Dr. Ababni, who classified the patient as American Society of Anesthesia grade three. Uh, this is the constant form that we uh, try to uh, mention every time we discuss these cases. It has to be discussed in details. And there is a very important point that we must mention to the patient that he has many tumors on different side parts of his body. We are going only for one tumor, which is the cerebral tumor. We are not going for all the tumors. Patient must know this, his family must know this. And they must know that the other tumors, they will grow in this future and he may develop the new tumors. This must be mentioned in the consent form in addition to the complications. Surgery in, in, uh, in my series are done in the sitting position who are experts in this. We are one of the few centers that's still using the uh, sitting position around the world. Uh, we don't, we are not trying to use it. We are not afraid of air embolism. In fact, we have air embolism in every case because this is sitting position, but we early detect it and treat it. And this is the view that you will have once you open. Uh, the CSF from the blood will just flow down. You don't need even an assistant. Let's see the surgery quickly of this particular patient, the Iraqi patient. As I said, it is in the sitting position. 
uh, we are just here opening the cystic part. Remember, there's a large cyst with a nodule, and the nodule is towards the tentorium. So this is the fluid coming out. It's clear fluid, a little bit yellowish, but clear. This is the cyst cavity. As we said, there are no contrast enhancement on MRI, so you don't need to take the cyst out, the cyst wall, but you need to take the nodule. And you treat the nodule as an ABM. You go around it, you pick the feeders, and you keep the venous drainage till the end, and you remove it in one piece. This is feeder. Feeders are coming from these so-called tentorial surface of the cerebellum. This is the suboccipital surface. There's a surface here, the petrous surface, and this surface is the tentorial surface. So we go around, pick the feeders, and we go down. Again, it's nice to have a neurosurgeon as your uh, co-surgeon, and in this case, Dr. Hamid Jalad was here with us. He's a Australian trained in neurosurgeon. Uh, so it's nice to have somebody with experience with you and uh, we have been put together for some time. So this is the feeder. But again, the fluid and the blood will just go down by gravity in the sitting position. In the prone position or back bench position, it will just accumulate in front of you. So that's the whole trick. Feeders, you pick them. And I use dirty, dirty, so-called, because I don't clean it, so that will not transmit much of the heat. I go around the feeders. If you don't leave one feeder, it will grow back again. So you have to remove it in block, in block as one lesion, not in pieces. Don't ever try to remove pieces of hemangioblastoma. AVM, hemangioblastoma, hemangiopericytoma should be taken as one piece in block. So this is the last piece. And the region is there for you to remove. And you don't, as I said, you don't deal with the cystor. Okay, we'll just proceed. There was no need for a shunt. This patient had a shunt, there was no need. Uh, Mr. Watology, Dr. San Annette, please. This is the first report of the fluid that we sent for Dr. Hassan. Okay. <clears throat> the fluid actually uh, is not helpful uh, studying uh, doing the cytology on these cases because uh, there are usually no tumor cells within the fluid, and so it's only done as a routine. But for the histopathology, the piece that we received was 2.2 by 2 by 1.7 centimeters. And uh, this is a view of uh, the low power view. As you can see, it is quite vascular. Yeah. These, there are different sized blood vessels, small uh, uh, capillary type to cavernous size. And in between, yeah, there are a lot of uh, stromal cells that have a clear cytoplasm. This is again, another view and it shows you that uh, the tumor is well demarcated this is the remnant cerebellar tissue. Probably there are some uh, granular cells here, but uh, there is some edema also as well. And uh, you can see that the tumor here, uh, these are the stromal cells with the clear cytoplasm and the blood vessels, highly vascular tumor. Same thing, higher magnification, just to show you the stromal cells and the blood vessels. And this is the classic uh, appearance of hemangioblastomas generally. Uh, this is higher power view just to show the cells, the stromal cells that are vacuolated. And uh, uh, with this particular history that this patient has uh, von hippel lindau syndrome, and he has also renal tumors, we have to make sure that we are not dealing with the metastasis. So I think next slide. Yeah, just to show you the stromal cells with the clear vacuolated cytoplasm. Uh, not much in the way of pleomorphism. Some preemphasis is acceptable, but mitotic figures are usually infrequent or absent. And this is uh, what I'm referring to when you see that some examples, they will have a typical nuclei, but that does not make, make them malignant. I did only, I don't usually do immunomarkers on 
uh, hemangioblastomas because the morphology is straightforward, except if there is some sort of confusion. Here, in this case, I wanted to roll out uh, metastatic renal cell carcinoma, so I did alpha inhibin, and usually it's positive in the tumor cells, but in renal cell carcinoma, it is negative, and that was the only stain that I did. Thank you. So the diagnosis is hemangioblastoma and it's part of von hippel lindau syndrome. We did the post-operative MRI the very following day. We don't uh, wait. We don't wait for days or weeks. It's done the very next day, day one. And it shows you that we have done a good job. We removed the culprit, we removed the cyst and the solid tumor. We, were not, we did not deal with the other tumors as we explained to the patient and his family. Actually, his gait and balance improved, his dysmetria improved, and Dr. Hamarne closed his tracheostomy on the fifth day. And this is the patient. This is tracheostomy tube closed. And this is the uh, rather long for a few days ago when he came to my clinic. So uh, the conclusions of this presentation is hemangioblastomas could be single, sporadic, and they were single sporadic, not part of bone hippelindau disease. They are microsurgically curable benign tumors. While if you have a bone hippelindau syndrome, there is no cure, as there is no way to reverse the mutation. So your job is to early recognize these lesions, treatment of the symptomatic culprits. You don't go and do a woody woodpecker for each lesion that is there. So you just choose the lesion that you want to remove. All in all, they don't live long. They will succumb to the, to the disease, to the carcinoma that they have. And the aim of surgery, whether it is von Hippel or sporadic, is to remove the tumor in block excision, like an AVM. But the surgery indications are very, very limited. It's limited to multiple recurrent, not as multiple recurrent, that defy microlinear surgery. Again, radio surgery or stereotactic radiotherapy could be the weapon that the inefficient surgeon uses because he is not able to do surgery. Embolization should be reserved for selective cases, but there's a large solid vascular lesion. So you don't do embolization for anything, and I've shown you many papers saying that it is not good. Any future perspectives? Yes, it may be interferon therapy in the future, anti-angiogenic therapy in the future, but still, von Hippel and down disease is a challenge for each and every one in his own discipline. With this definition, we open the floor for discussion. Uh, please, just relax. So on the uh, point of angiogenic therapy, <clears throat> um, hemangioblastomas, uh, is, uh, anti antigenic therapy like sunitinib uh, and the like have been tried in hemangioblastomas, even in the context of one hundred Lindau. And unfortunately, they were shown not to work, which was quite um, uh, a letdown because these agents are known to be effective in renal cell carcinoma, particularly metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Now back to, to, to this scenario. Uh, now that the major issue at the current time has been dealt with, we have to be <clears throat> cognizant of the fact that these patients need a vigilant follow-up for life by uh, uh, looking for all the tumors that uh, we alluded to earlier. So after all of this, you don't want to be missing a recurrent of the renal cell carcinoma or a worsening of the hemangioblastoma in the brain or elsewhere or a, a worsening of the retinal lesion. So, and not to miss elite development of fake homocytoma. And we mentioned about the, 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 the metanectin screens that you should, and that should be done on six to 12 month intervals. And you have to be reminded of the fact to avoid CT scan contours as, as much as possible during the follow-up because you don't want to destroy the reserve of the kidney, particularly given the fact that they may actually need really section of part of the kidney remnant if they, if they develop uh, another renal cell carcinoma uh, uh, for which they are prone to um, uh, uh, to happen. So, Hiyabi, you wanted to ask Yeah, uh, I just want to say that uh, because what you have said also now, uh, Yani, and we have nine uh, bit CT scans and we don't have any one bit MRI. 
So uh, in such a case, in your case now, the fMRI in certain things uh, much more sensitive because there is a CT scan. What contrast has to be done with every PET? You don't do PET CT scan without contrast. And radiation, of course. So you will have contrast and radiation, two negative things. So you will have uh, nowadays, which is, I mean, uh, <coughs> you can find it everywhere, PET MRI. Uh, first of all, it's much more sensitive and the neuro part, even in the body nowadays, in new machines, even for the abdomen, the MR is as good as CT, uh, uh, even more than that, especially uh, if you can have a, an image like a PET, which is a whole body diffusion image, which is, it looks like a PET, and it can detect malignant, small malignant tissues, very small, sub-centimeter, millimeters, from the prostate to the brain, anywhere, by using uh, huge and imaging with certain B values. So uh, I think the next machine in Jordan, wherever it is, should be uh, MRI, PET MRI. It's, uh, I mean, and uh, like Dr. Abdullah said, that the, our problem is we don't have now only FDG, maybe they have uh, one more agent. So we should have more and more uh, radioactive agents for certain more things. This Thank is the you. problem actually introducing PET MRI for the country. You have only a PG. I mean, by a PG pack, you can get an excellent image. You can fuse it later to an MRI machine, and that's that kit. You put an interrogatory. If we develop more and more, we need a radio chemistry. We need a radio, uh, radio chemistry. And if we do that, yes, then we can go for MRI. But you get the machine, and then you don't have the radio pharmacy. What to do with that? I'd like to welcome Dr. Adnan Abraj. I'll just spot it and welcome, sir. Any, any comments from your part as a Long-standing oncologist. Actually, quite uh, disappointing because these agents did work in metastatic cell and they revolutionized the therapy of metastatic cell. But when applied to those scenarios, the data to date, uh, unfortunately, are negative. Which is negative. That's what I'm saying. They are trying. No oh, yeah, they are so far, they are negative, unfortunately. Tom Reese, do you want to add anything? Oh, no, but I mean, <laughs> I have to tell you this story. When I finished my medical school in Egypt, uh, I came back to Jordan that was back in 1977. And you have to sit for an exam. It's called internship exam. And Dr. Abrajab was my examiner. And I followed him after that. And if you look to one of his charts, you would find the history that he writes in his own handwriting in the blue ink. And then the recommendations in the red ink. So you could read three, four pages of detailed account, something that you don't see these days. People forgot about history and examination. Maurice, do you want to add anything? No, thank you. It's very, very nice presentation. I mean, I think that 
Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. My, my, uh, my series of the brainstem, which is the most difficult, the 16 cases of brainstem. That's very, very much high number of brainstem and mandibular stones. Cerebellar ones, I have something like 70. So it constitutes something like 3% of all intracranial tumors. How many more stones will you have? Maybe. How many more stones will you have? It, it should be, it should be because of the intermarriage and because we don't have genetic counseling and so on, it should be. Ammar, do you want to add anything? Ammar and Baidin, neurologist? It's a very rare disease. It's a very rare disease, sure. Just to comment on the teaching center, Ammar, it's a very rare disease. Sure. You have safe partners. We don't have academic services that can't start the service. So we don't. We don't have to agree. Uh, yes. So, Ziad Mahadeen, do you want to add anything? For the whole class, had about tracheostomy indications of when do you close it and so on. Ibrahim said that the tumors have you seen cases of retinal hemangiomas? To differentiate between uh, metastasis, the acid carcinoma, and the mandibular stoma, we are using now perfusion. Perfusion relative cerebral blood volume is increased in the mandibular stoma because it's a vascular. In the dual, it's a vascular. But in metastasis, decrease cerebral blood volume, which is can help. Second thing is, uh, we said that the uh, 20 to 30 percent of the brain uh, attributed to the von Hebelin Down syndrome. In the spine, 80 percent attributed to no, sporadic. sporadic and uh, young age with bad prognosis. Dr. Bazin, to rephrase Dr. Maurice's question, from your hemangiosoma series, how many of those were actually from the Hebelin Down syndrome? It's the same percentage of oh, the same. Yeah, same percentage. Uh, because the intermarriage issue, I would I should expect should be less of an issue because it's an absorbent dominant. That's what the soma resistant disorders. Now the 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 challenges that we're facing, you know, they, these patients are actually counting. My other oncologist, you know, you actually 50% of your progeny would be carriers. And therefore, 50% of your, your progeny would develop tumors or an atlas later on in their life, if not early on. And it is unfortunate that would, that would not necessarily dissuade them from having this tumor, which I, I personally believe is criminal. But that's actually true. Uh, so it's that insistence on, on procreation that is an issue as opposed to the intermarriage part. So, Jalad, you trained in Australia. Have you seen cases of? Uh, and then was some there. Okay. All right. We will stop here and uh, again remind you that this has been transmitted and will be broadcast on the neurosurgical TV in uh, uh, Miami, Florida, USA by Dr. John Bennett. We thank him for his uh, uh, contribution to us for allowing us to reach to the international audience from here from Farah Healthcare Campus. We will do this every week, 52 weeks a year, unless we have snowstorm or something in Jordan. Uh, people don't think that we have snow in Jordan, but we do. So un until, unless we have that, we will continue doing this transmission every week from Farah Healthcare Campus. Thank you, and we will meet next week. Okay, is anybody there? Hello.
Can you hear me okay? Hello, Dr. Ibrahim. Abdul, hello, can you hear me? Hello, Abdul. Hello. Hello. Jeremy, can you talk now or off air? Hello, Ibrahim or Abdul. Hello. You're muted. You need to unmute. Abdul, you need to unmute. Hello, John. Hello, hello. Can you see me? Can you see me? Can you hear me, Abdul? Hello? Can you can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Hello, Abdul. Yes, welcome, John. Oh, good, good. Okay, we're not on air now. We're off the air. Okay. Okay, I need to speak to you. I need to see your face. Okay. Okay. Okay, well, well we had some problems. Um, uh, because your internet is not strong. Oh, okay, yes. no, but uh, this was just a learning experience. This week was just a learning experience, okay? Y yes, yes. Don't, think, don't uh, worry uh, about it. This, uh, no, we're we're going to make mistakes. Also. And I was not able to record it on YouTube, on Facebook, but I put it on YouTube. Okay, thank you, John. Thank you very much. Okay, and, and it was live on on neurosurgical TV, uh, yeah. but we had some issues with, uh, it, it wasn't a complete broadcast, uh, but that's okay, we're just starting, okay? Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, and and can, I speak, can I speak to Dr. Sabaya, is he there? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Sorry, John, doctor already. Yeah, because, we have, we have to we have to connect your your internet to the to this broadcast you have to broadcast with a good internet okay just a minute uh, just a minute oh. Okay, John. Yes. Hey, how you doing, Dr. Sabaya? John? Hello. Yes, I can you you can hear me, right? Yes, I can. Hi, hi, Dr. Sabaya. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm, I'm Dr. Bennett from Miami. Nice to, to hear you. Okay, we are learning this technology. Uh, tonight was a learning learning experience. Thank you. Okay, uh, we, we have to make some adjustments. We have to get a better connection to your internet in the auditorium. Sure. Okay, but we'll work, we'll, I'll work on that with Muhammad. Okay. Uh, but I, you, I must congratulate you. You have a very unique setup of case presentations. Excellent. Thank you. 
Well, I'd like to improve the technology so we could do it regularly because you could provide a great service to young neurosurgeons uh, in the world. <laughs> that's exactly, we, that's exactly that we are, what we're aiming to is the education is to spread the information we have, spread the neurosurgical knowledge among the younger generation, tell them what to do, what not to do, and the amount of knowledge that they need to practice. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's unique, and uh, I think uh, I think it's a complete education for a neurosurgical resident to to hear the other specialties talk about the issues, uh, etc. It's just a unique approach to case presentations, and uh, and I'd like to really really get the technical part ready so that we can effectively show your broadcast every Wednesday. Thank you. It's a pleasure and we will be there every Wednesday and uh, we have a lot of cases and Jordan, as I mentioned, is a medical surgical hub in the Middle East and I just mentioned some of the uh, medical uh, landmarks in Jordan that in 1972 we had the first uh, renal uh, transplant, 73 the first open heart surgery, 1985 the first cardiac transplant, IVF baby in 1986, and we had MRI in 1987, and we have the gamma knife back in 1996. So Jordan is a medical hub in the region as well as a touristic hub. And yeah. the, that's why we get a lot of cases, complicated cases, and we have uh, around us, uh, the, the siblings of the surgery are there, the oncologists, the immunologists, and so on. So I established this kind of discussion because I feel that residents going to conferences will just hear a speaker speak for about 10, 15 minutes about his, you know, uh, surgical expertise. But this yeah. is not enough. It is not good for a new surgical resident. We need to go to the bottom of this. We need to give him the exact nature of the disease and how to tackle it. So I'm very happy. Uh, I'm very happy to hear and see you and hope that uh, this relationship is going to be long lasting. Yes, this is this is just a start. This is just a start. Exactly, sir. Just a Thank start. You. And and I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, this is Sunday, we're televising live neurosurgery uh, by an ENT surgeon, but he's an endoscopist. He's a skull-based surgeon. Yes. Uh, so that's an example of how a neurosurgeon can learn from other Absolutely. We learn from each other, absolutely. Yeah. So I appreciate you and I applaud your efforts and I'll do my best uh, to bring your excellent format, uh, especially for the Arab world. Uh, I've got a lot of good response from Arab neurosurgeons uh, and I, I'm sure the community will grow. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. And we we'll hopefully meet with you next Wednesday. Okay, thank you. Okay, can I speak to Abdul there, please? Yes, please. Thank you, doctor. Okay, John, thank you. Okay, Abdul, this is just a start. We're, we're learning. Okay? Yes, sure, sure, sure. We're learning. Uh, and we can make adjustments. Uh, I, I know that your hospital has fast internet. Okay, I know they do. Yes, uh, yes. W w this was okay, but Wi-Fi really doesn't consistently and effectively show the, show the complete broadcast. Uh, do you know what I mean? Sometimes yes. there were delays, the screen froze, uh, et cetera. Uh, yes, yes. So I, know, I, know uh, yeah. I, I can work with the, well, the technician really needs to get a good connection to the auditorium. Do, do you know oh. what I'm saying? A wired connection. Okay, I guess. And I'm sure that can be done. And it's well worth the money. It's, I mean, just wire. It's just wire, yes. that's all. And I'm yes. sure uh, you, you, the connection is not far. I want you to run a test for me right now, and I'll I'll show you what I mean. Okay, here I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a, a, a link. I want you to run right now on your on the laptop that okay. that you're broadcasting from. Okay. 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 I just gave you a link. I want you to run that and tell me the numbers. You, do you see the link? Yes, 
Uh, sorry, where? Speedtest.net. Yes, uh, here. Yeah, run that. Run that on the laptop that you're using. And that that'll give me some numbers. Another YouTube. This is YouTube. Another YouTube. Another T-shirt. Sorry. Are you there, uh, Mohammed? Yes, I'm. I'm here. Are you running that program? Okay. And I want you to give me three numbers. I want you to give the ping, the download, and the upload. Yes, this chat. Okay. Okay, it's doing it. Is it doing it now? Hmm? John? Yes. Okay, I will talk with technician about uh, about wireless. If it will be a wire is better than wireless, and uh, uh, to check if it is a stable network. Okay. Do you have the? Did you run that test on the the speedtest.net? Did you run that test? No. Yes. Put that link on there now. I want you to. I want you to tell me the numbers right now. Where? Where is the, the link? Where? Speedtest.net. www.speedtest. I sent you the link on WhatsApp. Okay, okay. You see it? Okay. okay, we'll see the speed. Yeah, I want you to click on that link and tell me the numbers. I'm going to share my screen. Do you know what I'm saying? Do you, you got the website? You got the link? Okay, we're now. I'll just, just try to check the, the speed. It is actually. Four mega. John? Yes. Four mega, I think. What's the ping? That's four megabit per second. Okay, what's the download? This is the download, I think. Download is four. No, we'll check again. And what is upload? What is the ping value? Okay, I check again. Actually, this is the download. What's what is it? Is a ping? What is the number for the ping? 
Seven mega per second. How much? Seven mega. Seventy. Yes, seven mega. Okay. And okay. the download? Yes, this download seven to eight. Seventy-eight. Seven to eight. Uh, media, okay, yeah, I want you to share the screen with that. Okay. Like right now, I'm going to share the screen with, I'm going to show you what I mean. Okay, okay. Okay, hold on. I'm going to share the screen to what I I have with my values. Okay. I, is this the screen you're seeing? The I'm sharing the screen now. Do you see my share, screen share? Do you see that? Do you see that screen? Yes. Okay, I want you to tell me the ping, or you can write it in your WhatsApp. John. Yes. You have 154, but here yes. just seven to eight. Yeah, I want you to write the numbers down. I want you to write the ping, the down. Yeah, see the numbers I got? But those, yes. are, those are very good. Okay, yes. I'm at a good connection. But you could be getting much better numbers. These are the important numbers that show the strength of the transmission. Yes. Okay. And they tell me that's, you know, we have to improve. Okay. Because, you know, this is an excellent format that you have at presenting cases. Okay, there, great, great. You're presenting. Okay. Up toast error. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, okay. You have a firewall blocking. So what? What is the, most hospitals have that? That means that you can't. Uh, but I'm sure. But I'm sure. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. Okay. Maybe you're doing. It. I don't know what you did. You went around the firewall. You you devil you. Okay. okay. That's excellent. Great. That's exactly what I want. 70 that that shows that it's not a good connection it's probably two or three. Oh, that's not that's not too bad now the upload is is basically the image that you send me Okay, okay, that's a firewall. That's okay. There's not much you can do about that. Uh, it has, don't worry about it. Uh, no. But essentially, uh, the technician, I'm sure there's a good internet. Every hospital in the world has a good internet connection because they have to do business, you know, in their offices and stuff. Yes. Sure. And, uh, and he just basically has to bring that to the auditorium. And most of the time, it's just bringing a wire, so it's okay. a wired connection. Is he is the technician there? No, no, here not now available here. But I will talk with him. Okay. okay. Yes. Please, yeah. Just and please impress them that we need to get a good connection there. Okay. Uh, it's okay. A th it's okay, but you can't yes. have the screen freezing if people are watching. <laughs> Uh, and and it's and the and the audio has to be consistent. It can't stop. Yes. yes. And, and it will continue with this connection. And people, not many people, would like to watch because yes. of the problems. So yes. Okay. Can, when can we talk again? Oh, sure, sure. I no, will when, 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 when do you want to talk uh, again? Give. give uh, I will send to you a message by WhatsApp or Facebook. Okay. Okay, let, let me know when, when we can, I can meet with the technician, okay? Okay, sure. Uh, just just uh, WhatsApp, send me a message and WhatsApp. Okay, sure. But there's a tremendous, uh, you're doing gr a great job setting this up. It's tremendous Thank uh, you. setup Thank you. that he has, tremendous format of showing cases. I mean, it's a, it can be a great learning experience. Thank uh, you, to, thank you. To thank a lot you. of students and a lot of residents and to people in Yemen and uh, other places, they can learn a lot. From, yes, sure, sure. Yes. Doing that. So thank you very much. And and uh, uh, it's just a learning experience. It, it didn't go through very well, but we'll, we'll get better. Yes, sure. Thank you, thank you, John. Okay, okay, okay I'm gonna you. stop. Have a good day. Have thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Have a good day.